Okay, I think we can now start. In the meantime, people can still come in. So good afternoon and welcome to you all to the panel organized by the European Central Bank within the EEA ASM meeting on the topic implications of the rise in non-bank financial intermediation. My name is Elena Caletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University and I'm delighted to chair this panel. As I believe it touches a topic of utmost importance, I believe we should discuss much more than we normally do, in particular, I would say, in Europe, because the US, this is much more already advanced topic. So let me start by welcoming our speaker in the order in which they will speak. We have Isabel Schnabel, member of the executive board of the ECB and also a former colleague of the university, Ralph Koijan who has a very long title, so let me mention it. He is the AQR Capital Management Distinguished Service Professor of Finance and the Pharma Faculty Fellow University of Chicago the Good School of Business. And finally, Maria Sunta Giannetti, who is a Professor of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. So thank you to all of you for being here. Before giving you the floor, let me just spend one minute to, to set the framework for the attendees. As we all know, non-bank financial intermediation has grown massively in the last decade and has become an important source of financing for the corporate sector, but also a means of investment for households. The structural change in the financial system may have important consequences on the one hand for monetary policy and the transmission, and on the other hand for financial stability and new risks that may emerge in the financial system. So these are precisely the topic that we will discuss today. Isabel will start discussing the implication of the rise of non-bank intermediation for monetary policy transmission, while Ralph and Maria Sunta will touch more on financial stability issues or risk in a way. In particular, Ralph will focus on the insurance sector and will discuss the shift from defined benefit plans to life insurer and defined contribution plans, and we'll look at the risks that such a shift entails. Whereas Maria Sunta will talk about the role of unregulated institutional investors, such as mutual funds and hedge funds, in the market for deteriorated syndicated loans and how this may affect the shape and the composition of the syndicates. So this is a very rich of topics, which I hope will trigger a lot of discussion uh, at the end of the session. So each speaker will have a 10, 12, maximum 15 minutes for the initial remarks so that we have some time for discussion. And I kindly invite all those that participated to ask a question to our speaker through the Q&A chat box in the bottom bar of the screen. So it's the Q&A box and it's not the chat box in the bottom bar of the screen. And now let me stop here and let me give you the floor, Isabel, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for the, um, the kind introduction. Let me try to share my screen. I hope you can see it fine. Not yet, but it's coming. Okay, very good. Yes, so, perfect. Okay, excellent. So let me say first, it's it's a great pleasure to have all of you here in this uh, in this fantastic, very fascinating uh, session. So um, in my um, remarks, I will discuss, uh, as Elena already mentioned, uh, how monetary policy transmission uh, is shaped by the structure of the financial system and specifically by the relative uh, importance uh, of bank versus non-bank uh, finance. And uh, just to remind you that, of course, my slides and also a longer version of the speech is available on the ECB's uh, website, as, uh, as always. Um, I would like to start by highlighting three key stylized facts about the development of non-bank finance uh, in the uh, euro area, and Elena already alluded uh, to this. So first, and this is shown on the left-hand side chart, um, based on the evolution of total financial assets, the uh, non-bank financial intermediaries have become increasingly relevant uh, in the euro area. So in the early years of the euro, the bulk of financial assets were uh, still held on the balance sheets uh, of banks. But since the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, the overall growth in financial assets can almost entirely be traced to non-bank entities which uh, by, no, by now represent uh, more than half of the total financial asset holdings in the euro area. Uh, second, it is shown on the right-hand side, 
the role of different types of financial instruments has also changed over time. Bank loans clearly remain the dominant debt instrument to finance uh, the corporate uh, sector, but uh, corporate bonds have become much more relevant since the global financial crisis. Uh, however, let me stress that the use of bonds remains quite uh, uneven. So corporate bond markets in the euro area are still mainly populated by larger companies. So out of the 19 million firms that we have in the euro area, only about 2,000 issuers are active in corporate bond markets. So despite the notable increase in bond issuance, the overwhelming majority of euro area firms, and in particular, the small and medium-sized enterprises still rely on banks. And there's also evidence that, uh, that bonds complement rather than substitute firms' existing financing sources. So firms, that have started issuing bonds have often not cut back on their borrowing from banks. And the third key fact is that uh, financing structures differ across euro area countries. So while firms in some countries, uh, so take France as an example, make uh, ample use of bond markets, issuance in others like Spain remains moderate. And this partly reflects the size distribution of companies uh, in those countries. Uh, for the ECB, it is, of course, crucial to understand uh, the impact of the rise of non-bank finance on the transmission of our monetary uh, policy. And uh, one reason why the increase in non-bank financial intermediation may matter are systematic differences in the balance sheet structure uh, of banks and non-banks. Uh, so loans make up most of a bank's assets, some 60%, while they account for under 10% of investment fund assets. Uh, conversely, debt securities play a much a larger role for investment funds, approximately 40%, compared with around 10% for banks. Uh, and even within asset classes, and this is shown on this slide on the left-hand side, the composition differs with the bond portfolios of investment funds carrying much higher credit and duration risk than those of banks. And these differences in balance sheet composition may translate into heterogeneous responses to different types of monetary policy measures. So uh, for instance, asset purchases tend to exert stronger effects on duration and credit risk uh, premia, whereas policy rate changes have a more direct impact on shorter term loan market conditions. Uh, that means that the difference in balance sheets of banks and non-banks may give rise to different responses to a given type of policy instrument. And um, recent ECB staff analysis has tested uh, this intuition. Um, the analysis distinguishes between two types of monetary policy shocks. So the first is a short-term interest rate shock, which uh, would arise primarily in the context of the ECB adjusting its main policy rates. And the second is a longer term interest rate shock, which would, uh, for example, occur in response to central bank asset purchases. And uh, the exercise and the results are shown on the right hand side highlights the different impacts of policy easing shocks across different types of financial intermediaries uh, measured here by changes in the size of balance sheets. Uh, the assets of both banks and investment funds expand in response to an accommodative short rate shock with the size of the response being broadly similar. And um, this finding confirms that the key ECB interest rates remain a powerful policy instrument also in a world in which market-based finance has expanded measurably. Uh, by contrast, in, you can see that on the very right-hand side, Long rate shocks transmit quite differently across these two types of intermediaries. In fact, uh, only investment funds appear to be affected in a persistent fashion. I should mention that the uncertainty around these estimates uh, is, however, quite large. And uh, earlier findings uh, in the literature suggest that asset purchases incentivize banks to extend credit to the real uh, economy. So by reducing uh, the return of risk-free assets, asset purchases may make lending to firms more attractive for banks. Uh, but at any rate, these uh, results provide a tentative indication that the rise in non-bank finance has broadened the transmission of monetary policy in the euro area by reinforcing the impulse that's coming from measures that act directly on the long-term interest rate. And this is actually encouraging in an environment 
in which the risk of hitting the zero lower bound and hence the need to activate uh, asset purchases has increased. The balance sheet uh, response of intermediaries is, uh, of course, only the first step of the transmission process. What matters most for monetary policy is the impact on the later stages of the transmission process. And the first um, important aspect is whether monetary policy triggers different adjustments in the credit conditions in corporate bond and loan markets. And ECB analysis suggests that this is indeed uh, the case, and this is shown on the left-hand side. So standard monetary policy shocks running through changes in short-term rates have a stronger impact on the rates charged for bank loans than for corporate bonds. And uh, this has important implications for the link between monetary policy and the financing structure of the economy. So in primarily bank-based economies like the euro area, a larger share of corporate debt is remunerated at loan rates rather than bond rates, implying that the overall cost of credit is more responsive to conventional monetary policy measures than in economies with a higher share of bond finance. And these changes in credit market conditions uh, appear significant further along the transmission chain as displayed on the right-hand side. Uh, the impact of uh, short rate policy shocks on GDP is much more marked in economies that have more bank-based financial systems, which is in line with recent findings uh, in the literature. Conversely, when considering shocks to longer term interest rates, the pattern actually reverses. So long rate shocks exert stronger real effects on economies that are more reliant on bond finance. For the euro area, these findings reinforce that the key ECB interest rates remain the most important instrument. At the same time, it is likely that the recent changes in the euro area's financing structure have strengthened the impact uh, of our asset purchases on uh, real economic uh, activity. A deepening of the capital markets union may reinforce these effects further and thereby also increase the resilience of policy transmission in the euro area. And this is because a more balanced funding mix is important as a shock absorber or uh, as a, a spare tire, um, as Ellen Greenspan said. Uh, when the global financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis hit the euro area, the disproportionate reliance on the banking sector as a source of external finance proved to be a major uh, vulnerability. However, the increase of non-bank finance may also come with new risks for the monetary policy transmission mechanism. And at the heart of these concerns is the question as to whether monetary policy induces excessive risk-taking by non-banks thereby becoming a source of financial distress and hampering uh, monetary transmission. So for example, there is evidence that money market funds invest in riskier asset classes when interest rates uh, are low. And in the same vein, uh, bond mutual funds reaching for yield appear to generate higher returns and attract more inflows, especially in periods uh, of low interest rates, but they underperform on a risk-adjusted basis and are exposed to high liquidity risk. Recent ECB uh, research suggests that incentives for investors to take on risk may differ with the choice of the policy instrument. So asset purchases, which leave their strongest footprint at the long end of the yield curve, are typically associated with persistent net inflows into bond investment funds, with the inflows being larger for riskier fund types, as shown on the left-hand side. There's less evidence of higher risk taking by investors following shocks to the short end of the yield curve. Asset managers also persistently reduce um, fund cash holdings following expansionary monetary policy shocks with changes in short-term rates having a stronger impact on funds cash holdings, as you can see on the right-hand side. Low liquidity holdings and the resulting liquidity mismatch uh, leave funds vulnerable to large outflows during periods of stress. And the market turbulence that we've seen in March 2020 vividly illustrated that investment funds can be subject to runs in the form of large investor redemptions, leading to fire sales and thus exacerbating market disruptions through self-reinforcing price spirals. Uh, at that time, investment funds shed assets on a large scale, and this sell-off was actually much larger than the outflows that they were facing. Recent analysis shows that less regulated investment funds tended to engage in more pro-cyclical selling 
and cash hoarding than more strictly uh, regulated funds. And while it can be, uh, of course, individually rational for fund managers to sell assets in excess of current outflows, when the uncertainty about future redemptions is high, such uh, cash hoarding can be detrimental to wider financial stability. The ECB's monetary policy interventions in the wake of the pandemic were successful in preserving financial stability in the euro area. Nevertheless, the underlying vulnerabilities in the non-bank sector certainly need a structural fix, not least in order to mitigate uh, the risk of moral hazard. Macroprudential policies need to be significantly enhanced to address the structural vulnerabilities exposed by the market turmoil of March 2020, in particular with respect to liquidity mismatches in money market and investment funds. And the Financial Stability Board is expected to soon issue recommendations in that uh, direction. So let me uh, conclude. So although the euro area remains a bank-based economy, the rise in non-bank finance has important implications for the transmission of our monetary policy. The rise in non-bank finance has strengthened policy transmission through capital markets. However, this also comes with new risks that may, may impair policy transmission in periods of financial stress. And the current macroprudential policy framework needs to be developed further to strengthen the ability of authorities to limit the buildup of systemic risk in the non-bank financial sector and curb stress when it arises. And um, despite the relevance of these uh, questions, uh, also from a policy perspective, the academic literature on non-bank finance and monetary policy is still nascent. And uh, let me uh, close by saying that I would actually be very happy to see much more research on this uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you, Isabel, very much for this very interesting speech. And now we move to the academics. So we start with Ralph, please. Great. Um, thank you. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you also for including me in this uh, in this panel, uh, which is uh, on a great topic. So um, I'm going to talk about life insurance companies or the insurance sector more broadly, uh, which if you start thinking about sort of like uh, non-bank financial intermediaries are, uh, are important players that we often don't think so much about. So let me sort of like take a little bit of a step back, give you a bit of history of like why they became so uh, important. Um, and then think a bit about the risk um, uh, that is currently on the balance sheet of, of insurance companies and um, uh, why, that, why that matters. So what you see over here, this is data from the, from the US going back to like the uh, covering the whole post-war uh, period. What you see over here is as a, as a fraction of households uh, net worth, um, the size of different types of, of, of vehicles that have been used for retirement savings. So the, um, the, 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 the lighter dotted line over here, those are defined benefit pension plans. So those uh, grew uh, until like the early 80s, mid 80s, and then they gradually declined. Um, now what came in their place was, was defined contribution plans, which is the dashed line at the bottom over here. Um, uh, mutual funds, but of course, also in part, um, uh, life insurance companies, which is the solid line here on top. Okay, and so uh, at least in the US, um, the life insurance companies uh, combined with the PNC companies, which are smaller here at the bottom, those are actually the largest investor in corporate bonds. And so understanding corporate bond markets means we have to understand uh, insurance companies. Now, what is the narrative sort of that emerges and why is there, uh, uh, why do we think that there's risk on the balance sheet of insurance companies? So, so I mentioned there's this decline of defined benefit pension plans and, and, and in part replaced by DC plans and mutual funds, uh, but also life insurance companies. And I think the best way to think about life insurance companies nowadays is that they're really in the business of financial engineering. And so really like the products that they've been introducing uh, are so-called variable annuities in the US. They go under different names in different countries. Um, but essentially what they are, are mutual funds with minimum return guarantees. And these are very long dated products. So you have to think about it as, as you're buying these products when you're, let's say in your fifties and sixties, and then they run until you, until you die. So these are like, like very long dated minimum return guarantees where the insurance company is essentially giving you the maximum between the return on a diversified portfolio, let's say 6% stocks and 40% and, and bonds and 5%. And so, so given the long dated nature of these contracts, uh, these are very hard to hatch and to manage. The second source of like, like um, a growth uh, is coming actually from transfer from defined benefit pension plans to, to insurance companies. And so they've been effectively like moving those risks from, from firms to, to insurance companies. 
And at this point, variable annuities are the largest liability of US life insurance. Okay, and those products, again, are also prominent in, in many European countries, as I will talk about later on. Now, what are the risks associated with that? Um, so in principle, for insurance companies, this is a new source of capital and there's a steady stream of, of, of fees. And so once well managed, uh, this could be a good thing. Um, clearly from the household side, there's a very strong demand for these kinds of products. So, so with the decline of defined benefit pension plans, there's a very strong demand for some notion of like, like, like minimum return guarantees, but still the upside potential that financial markets are offering. And of course, it's potentially strengthened by, by additional tax, tax savings. And so the way to think about it, where the risk comes from, is that insurance companies are essentially writing like very, very long dated put options on the market. And you cannot hedge those products right away because in financial markets, the longest put options you can find are something like, have a maturity of something like three years. And so that leaves a lot of mismatch risk on the balance sheet of insurance companies. Now, that's exactly where, where things like monetary policy come in, because, of course, they're very sensitive to changes in interest rates, as I will, as I will show you. And so, so that's been sort of like one of the key, key risks on the balance sheet of, of insurance companies. Now, the, it, it may sort of like at first sight, it may look very similar to defined benefit pension plans, but there's important differences. Um, if you have defined benefit pension plans that are uh, sponsored by governments, then, of course, there's the ability to raise taxes or you can raise, raise pension contributions. That is something that is not possible for insurance companies. On top of that, like for the publicly traded insurance companies, there's market discipline. And so you'll see the stock prices fluctuate. And you see that, for instance, during the financial crisis, several insurance companies that were active in the variable annuity space, like Hartford, needed government support um, because their stock prices were, um, uh, were falling too much. Okay, so let me show you some evidence of risk mismatch. And I'm going to sort of go back to the financial crisis, but I'm going to also show you what happened during the COVID crisis last year. And you'll see that these risks are like extremely persistent given the long-term nature of these, of these contracts. Um, so I'm going to first show you sort of the dynamics of, of leverage. And I'm going to draw the comparison to banks here so you can sort of see them side by side. So the first thing to observe is if you look at the solid line over here, which is the leverage ratio of insurance companies defined as liabilities to assets, then life insurance companies are just as levered as, as banks are. Okay, and so, so they have a very, very small equity uh, portion of like something like between five and 10%. It's been gradually going down over here during the period where they start to take on more of these, uh, uh, of these variable annuity risks. But then you see that during the financial crisis, you see that the leverage spiked up even though banks were, uh, were sort of deleveraging uh, around, that, around that period. The second sort of like, like sort of like way you can see um, the mismatch risk on the balance sheet of, of insurance companies is to look at their stock returns. And I'm going to do that in two ways. So the first one over here is showing you the sensitivity of insurance companies to interest rates. And I'm going to break the period from 99 until 2017 into two periods, one before the financial crisis and the period thereafter. If you look at the period before the financial crisis, then their market beta was well below one consistent with the intuition that life insurance companies are these very safe institutions and somewhat, somewhat boring. They had no exposure to interest rates um, to speak of, and it was insignificant. If you look at the period following the financial crisis, like, like, like things changed quite a bit. The market beta doubles is now above, above one, but more noticeably, like you see their exposure to interest rates like changed a lot. And so this is the exposure to the 10 year bond return. So what that means is that if interest rates, if a 10 year interest rate like drops by 1%, then the equity prices of US life insurance drop by like 13%. And so very small changes in long-term interest rates have a very large impact now on the equity prices of life insurance companies. And so this is consistent with the duration gap of more than, of more than 10 years. And so that is like very, very large. And of course, then if you start thinking about um, uh, about sort of like monetary policy, conventional and unconventional, then of course the, the institutions you're directly sort of affecting are, are insurance companies. Now here you see like the persistence of those risks over time and how severe it was during, during last year's event. So there's been a lot of discussion about like the resilience of banks during like, uh, like last year episode, there's been a lot of discussion about the lack of resilience for open-end mutual funds. Um, but it turns out that insurance companies also were, were quite stressed during that period. So just to draw the comparison, what you see over here is the decline in the S&P 500. So that's a little over 30%. The second one is the financial sector more broadly that includes banks. And so they fell a little over 40%. But if you look at insurance companies, they fell more than 50%. Okay, And it's actually closer to airlines than they are to the S&P 500. 
Okay, and that's not exactly what you would expect to see or something that you would like to see uh, in the middle of a pandemic that life insurance companies are that are that vulnerable. Now, if you look at the cross section of companies, um, then these are sort of the declines of the different companies. So you see Lincoln, Bright House, which is really MedLife, uh, AIG, which of course we all know from the financial crisis. And a lot of the like companies over here are the very large ones and are actually the same ones as that sort of like got a lot of attention during the 2008 financial crisis. And that's sort of an important point that I want to highlight, which is fundamentally very different from, I think, investment funds, which is that because of the long dated nature of the life insurance liabilities, once they get stressed and these policies are on the balance sheets for like the next couple of decades, then you're really constraining their, uh, that insurance company for like a long period of time. And so their asset demand and all kinds of other things are going to be distorted for like a long period of time. So that's fundamentally very different from like, like, like rapid outflows that we need to remedy for like, let's say a three month window. Here, you're really stressing uh, a group of institutions for like a long period of time. Now to show that sort of like, like, like through stock prices, what you see over here is on the horizontal axis, the drawdown, so how much stock prices fell during the 2008 financial crisis. And then over here, how much they fell during the COVID crisis last, last, uh, uh, last year. And so you see a very strong relationship between the companies that got into trouble in 2008, get into trouble once again during the, during the COVID crisis. And so the way to think about this is that these companies are really constrained for like a very long period of time, um, which affects their uh, behavior as I'll, as I'll show you. So, so what are the consequences of, of risk mismatch? Like why would one care? And, and I think there's like three, um, um, three dimensions of this. So the first one is in terms of asset management. So, so there's lots of literature now showing that once insurance companies get constrained, um, that, that they act more conservatively. So they start sort of like reallocating their capital to safer investments, safer corporate bonds and things like that. As a result, you're going to have like a shift in asset demand that lasts for like a long period of time. Okay, and so that, of course, is going to feed into the funding cost of firms. And if you think about sort of amplification effects or spillover effects to the real economy, this is like an important dimension to, to think about. Then if you start thinking about sort of the household side, so, so we've shown in earlier work that the moment that insurance companies get constrained, they start sort of like, like adjusting the price of insurance that they charge to, to households. So insurance prices can, can become cheaper or more expensive depending on the on features of the regulation. Um, they may change the design of insurance contracts. So they may remove guarantees from the contracts that they're offering, even though we've discussed before that those products are potentially very important for, for households welfare, in particular with the decline of defined benefit pension plans. And on top of that, you see that there's more of those like risky liabilities that are moving off balance sheets to less regulated um, uh, reinsurance companies, which also may be, may be undesirable. And another sort of like feature that we see in the data quite strongly is that those insurance companies that get stressed uh, may actually exit the market altogether. And so what it, what it may lead to is that insurance markets are incomplete, not for the traditional reasons of like adverse selection or moral hazard, but really because financial constraints are binding and there's like too much risk mismatch associated with those, with those activities. So, so, so just to give you an idea of like the long lasting effect of, of these constraints, what you see over here is the fees on that insurance companies charge on those variable annuities. And there's two components. One is the component for, um, for the mutual funds that are underlying, which is this, this darker area over here. And then the bottom lighter area is the, is the fee that they're charging for those guarantees. And so you see in 2008, it jumps up very sharply and it stays there. That again is associated with the companies that get shocked more, they raise prices, they raise prices uh, more as well. At the same time, you see that, that lots of insurance companies start to drop out of the market. So this is the number of companies offering guarantees. It was increasing very rapidly leading up to the crisis. Then once they get shocked, they exit the market and lead it, that leads to market, market incompleteness. And so, so proper regulation of insurance companies and thinking about sort of the impact that things like monetary policy have on the insurance sector is important for the transmission to like corporate bond markets where they are very important players and also to the insurance markets that play a very important role if you think about sort of the uh, welfare of households in their uh, ability to save for retirement um, through those uh, guaranteed return uh, products. Okay, so, 
So we think that like, so there's important risks that remain. Um, everything I've told you is based on the US, given that we have better data there, uh, at least until the introduction of solvency do, uh, things are improving now a lot in Europe. Um, but of course, the kind of products that I'm talking about, those are also very prominent in, in lots of European countries as, as well. And so, so the low interest rate environment remains like a very, very important risk for insurance companies. And I think monitoring that very closely and understanding how it impacts their sort of like like asset demand and ultimately corporate bond prices is an important topic to uh, to explore. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you very much, Ralph. This was also most interesting. And now let's, before opening the floor to discussion, actually let me remind all the participants that they're very welcome to uh, ask our panelists question through the Q&A box at the bottom of the bar. So please, I strongly encourage you to do so. In the meantime, let me give the floor to Maria Sultan. Thank you. Maria Sultan, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Oh, finally, okay. I found <laughs> sorry about this. So I would like to thank you for having me in this interesting panel. I would like to shift the attention from bond markets to loan markets. So institutions have actually increased in importance also in loan market and leverage loan markets in particular. And of course, this is also an effect of the low interest rate environment in which institutions have been searching for yield. And of course, also the role of institutions in credit in loan markets is important for financial stability. Policymakers and a handful of academic papers have, in particular, considered how fire sales in loans can transmit to different types of intermediaries, for instance, to collateral loan obligation and cause price drops that are feedback in outflows and potentially amplifying negative shocks. What has attracted me, uh, my attention in this market is, however, whether institutions can um, amplify initial shocks to uh, credit quality. When we study loans, they, um, we typically uh, presume that any renegotiation with the borrower, a loan amendment uh, and the like are performed by banks. But uh, one um, effect of the rise of institutions in um, loan markets has been that banks have been selling deteriorating loans to other institutions. And, uh, uh, and this is also part of uh, an effect of the regulations that have increased the um, capital requirement for banks. So what we don't know in the current literature and what we try to address in this paper is understanding whether uh, when the ownership structure of uh, a loan changes, the new owners have the incentives and the skills to renegotiate and potentially cure the loan. So, um, this is uh, all what I will say is uh, based on uh, the U.S. syndicated loan market because uh, the U.S. happens to have extremely good data on how the ownership structure of the loan evolves and allow us uh, to follow up on the performance of the loan. But uh, uh, the idea was actually inspired by 
a lot of news coverage of banks in Southern Europe and Italy in particular are selling their deteriorating loans to institutional investors and hedge funds during the Euro financial crisis. So it would be very nice to know whether some of our results can be replicated in the Euro area. So what we will uh, ask is basically how the ownership structure of the loan evolves once there are some uh, regulatory downgrade that requires banks to set aside more capital. And what we will try to establish is how differences in the ownership structure have a causal effect on the loan subsequent performance. So let me show you some evidence that this question is relevant. What I'm showing here is on the x-axis, I am sorting a different syndicated loan based on their regulatory rating. So paths are the good loans, loss are the loans that will imply for the institution holding the loans assure loss of capital. In between, we have uh, um, loans of uh, different qualities. And what you see here is uh, who are the institutions that hold uh, these loans. What you observe is that the banks uh, play a relatively more important role for uh, the good loans. But uh, as the, trade, uh, uh, as, uh, the uh, credit quality deteriorates, you observe that the bank, uh, banks uh, sell and the other type of institution become more relevant. For loans that are special mentioned, these are still loans that are considered currently solvent, but that could imply some risk for the future. We observe that the other regulated institution, even if not banks, become important. These are the collateralized loan obligations that are organized as mutual funds, but are also subject to regulation. These CLOs start to get out of loans that becomes um, whose credit quality further deteriorates, like substandards and doubtful loans. Who starts holding these loans? Well, the mutual funds uh, play an important role, and the hedge funds also play an important role for loans of worse credit quality. So our concern here is that do these uh, are regulated institutions that uh, arrive and purchase uh, the loan once has been uh, downgraded, can, uh, can they help with uh, curing the loans or rather they try to simply benefit from fire sales price and uh, generate returns from a diversified portfolio? So um, this, there is uh, um, already in the descriptive uh, evidence that we present uh, some note of uh, optimism. What you see here is uh, as, uh, how the ownership concentration of uh, the loan evolves after a regulatory downgrade. Basically, we follow the number of lenders in the event of time after a loan has been downgraded. So what you see is that the uh, number of lenders uh, decreases. Why is this important and why would I care? So if on one side, I am concerned that the exit of the banks from loans that uh, be, uh, whose credit quality worsen may actually hamper a future renegotiation. On the other side, the higher uh, ownership concentration of the loan should they give lenders a stronger incentive to internalize externalities and should help with the cure of the loan in the future. So what we do in the paper is to try to understand when the new lenders, when the institutions have incentives to renegotiate the loan in a way that can improve the future loan performance. So we established in a, a more um, 
rigorous setting that the banks and CLOs indeed sell loans after they've been downgraded. Mutual funds and hedge funds are the type of institutions that enter, especially in loans at early stage of distress. Notwithstanding their arrivals, these institutions don't hold a simply diversified portfolio. It looks like that the concentration of the ownership of each single loan increases. And according to the uh, to theoretical work, this should give the new owners incentive to try rene to renegotiate uh, efficiently. I will give you some intuition of how higher ownership concentration lead, leads indeed to better loan outcomes. And then I will show you when concerns about the financial stability are indeed re relevant. That is when there are financial constraints for institutional investors that may hamper the increase in concentration of the loan. So what you see here is that we try to see whether a higher ownership concentration of the loan is indeed something that is related to a need for a renegotiation. And in order to address this, we try to, um, to split loans depending on the um, inefficiency that may arise if there is no renegotiation. So for instance, we typically think that if the borrower has very intangible assets, invests a lot in, uh, in uh, R&D, uh, there is a more like liquidation is more likely to be inefficient. So ownership concentration seems to be uh, higher in this sort of loan, suggesting that there might indeed be a way for uh, leading to more efficient renegotiation. However, this ownership concentration fails to emerge when institutions are financially constrained. So a nice feature of the data that we can access for the US is that we can observe the uh, uh, portfolio investment of each institutional investors in these syndicated loans. So basically, uh, the way we can uh, try to proxy for uh, um, the institution of financial constraints, looking at whether the institution in the past has uh, experienced other um, um, loan downgrade. If a mutual fund or a hedge fund has experienced other loan downgrade in the portfolio during the previous quarter, probably does not have uh, the time or the uh, willingness to um, purchase other riskier loans because renegotiation or engaging with a borrower is uh, costly. So what you observe here is that for different uh, loans that have been um, downgraded and therefore have a rating below pass, the larger is the shares of institutions that are subject to financial constraints, the higher remains the number of lenders of the loans. So basically, if uh, financial constraints are prevailing between the hedge funds and the mutual funds that invest in this segment of the credit markets, this beneficial increase in ownership concentration of the loan fails to emerge. Does this matter for the loan performance? Well, is, what we can show here is that uh, the fact that uh, there are some loans that are experiencing uh, poor performance in other industry does not predict the performance of loans that have not been downgraded after we control for a number of borrower characteristics. So basically, we use these proxies for financial constraints that you observe here 
in order for um, in order to obtain uh, arguably exogenous variation in uh, the concentration of the loan. So this allow us to tell uh, something that uh, is uh, can be interpreted as a causal causal um, on uh, the effect of the syndicate concentration on uh, the future loan performance. So what we observe here is that uh, after we have uh, instrumented uh, using uh, financial constraints of the lenders for uh, the ownership concentration, we uh, you observe that a more dispersed uh, syndicate uh, is uh, related to less uh, renegotiation of the loans and uh, importantly relates in the future to more uh, rating downgrades for uh, that loans and a lower um, uh, probability that uh, the loan is upgraded. So from this evidence, what we uh, conclude uh, is that uh, in normal times, uh, even in a market for in a credit market that is uh, dominated by institutional investors, uh, there are incentives that might enhance uh, fin uh, fin uh, the financial stability and might lead to cure the loans. So in normal time, the exit of banks and the CLOs that are more specialized in this, uh, um, in this uh, um, in loan renegotiation should not raise concerns about amplification of the initial shock to credit quality. However, when a regulated financial uh, institutional in uh, investors uh, are financially constrained because they experience redemptions or because they are already engaged in the renegotiation of other loans, concerns that the, um, these lenders might not have the incentives to renegotiate uh, increase. So uh, basically stabilization policies for and central bank in, in intervention in this case uh, should consider that uh, a larger part of uh, leveraged loans are held by uh, institutional investors so that uh, might be financially constrained and uh, might not be able to engage in renegotiation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Sunte. So you all also have been a very punctual in terms of timing, so we have uh, some time for discussion. So let me start uh, maybe going back to Isabel. And I have a two short questions, and then maybe we have a final round where I will ask all of you to discuss the role of regulation. But let me start with some other topic. One is uh, uh, the following. I had, I mean, somehow it was, I was struck by the data when you show us that there are 19 million firms in Europe, only 2,000 uh, issue bonds, and of which only 400 are eligible for the programs uh, um, of the ECB, the corporate sector purchase program. So the immediate question I had when I saw this number was, what should we do to sort of increase the, the, the number of firms that can be considered? I mean, the, the bonds ultimately that can be acquired by the ECB. Shall we change the eligibility criteria? Shall we instead try to foster firms to become bigger and issue bonds? I mean, being rated, for example, so that they become eligible. What is it that we should do? Because as you said, as you said several times, we, there is a lower risk, a lower zero bound, and also the, the possibility that you keep using the interest rate in the monetary policy somehow at least we can, or let's say these additional measures are more and more important. But on the other hand, the eligibility criteria restrict the firms and the bonds that can be actually acquired. So this was the first curiosity I had. The second one was referring to Ralph, I was struck when he said the impact that increases in interest rates ahead on the equity value of insurance companies. I thought the banks were actually performing the worst, but instead I see that insurance companies do, did much, much worse and for longer period than the banks. So then the question to you, Isabel, is to which extent does or may this affect monetary policy decisions in a way, to which extent the impact that monetary policy may have on other side of the financial sector that are not directly regulated, as we know, and they're not directly 
um, maybe linked to what we normally think of. I, I, for example, I think of the discussion, no, low interest rate and profitability of banks, but this is not just, this is only part of the discussion. So let me stop here and give you the floor. So thank you, Elena. These are two fascinating questions, uh, very, very interesting. Um, so on the first one, I think uh, the, uh, the best answer would of course be to further foster um, capital markets union. I mean, this, uh, the ECB has always been a, a strong proponent of capital markets union. And um, uh, as, as you know very well, um, uh, relatively little has uh, happened uh, if you just look at the, at the data. I mean, we've, of course, we've had many uh, initiatives, but it seems that this takes uh, a long time. But I think this is like in the, in the medium um, uh, to long term. I mean, of course, this is what, uh, what has to be done. Um, so changing uh, the eligibility criterion is certainly uh, not, not an option because this is something which is determined uh, mainly by risk management considerations. And for us, it's not so, uh, not so easy uh, to, to change that. And I should probably mention that, I mean, out of the uh, 2000 firms I mentioned, many are actually not rated. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that would uh, be uh, very difficult for us. Uh, but uh, you should also keep one thing in mind that, of course, um, uh, they are not, uh, I mean, if it comes to uh, ECB policy measures, they are not just asset purchases, but um, they are also, and this is just as important, uh, the refinancing operations uh, to the banking sector, so the TLTROs in particular at the moment. And uh, there, of course, um, uh, these have to be uh, collateralized. And um, uh, Actually, nowadays, if you look at the collateral pool, uh, this consists to a relatively large uh, extent um, uh, in credit claims. Um, and so uh, even, uh, even uh, firms uh, that uh, uh, you know, do not benefit uh, directly from the asset purchases basically benefit uh, through, through that uh, channel. But nevertheless, overall, I, of course, I agree that this, these numbers are, uh, are incredibly uh, small. Uh, the second point is also uh, very interesting. And I also, when I heard uh, Ralph, I also thought that actually this um, uh, is an aspect that uh, is uh, probably uh, under discussed and under uh, researched also, in, uh, I mean, in the central banking uh, community. I mean, I think the one of the main uh, differences between, uh, I mean, from our viewpoint uh, between banks and insurance companies is that of course uh, banks play a much more important role uh, for the transmission of our policies. And uh, they also play a more important role for um, uh, financial stability. And I think this is why uh, uh, kind of the, the side effects on our policies on the banking sector have um, uh, played a bigger role than, uh, uh, than those on insurance companies. Uh, but uh, I mean, of course, I'm aware of that uh, discussion uh, uh, very well. I mean, I, I would actually have a question to Ralph on, on this, uh, if I may, um, because I mean, I, I think it would be interesting to discuss uh, how you, Ralph, uh, judge the systemic risks uh, from uh, wh what you described in your uh, presentation. So do you, do you see a substantial uh, systemic risk? So I remember in my previous life to have uh, discussions with people from insurance companies in Germany and uh, I, I said, oh, oh, maybe we also need macroprudential policies for insurance companies. And they always said this is completely uh, outlandish. But um, so I would be interested in hearing that. Thank you. Perfect. The microphone is to you now. But let me add one, uh, um, one question that comes from Jonas Garten that says whether you could comment further on the policy implication of the larger risk you were showing. So it's somehow related to Isabel Pond. Please. Okay, great. Okay, well, there's lots of good questions. So, um, um, let me start by sort of like like uh, um, uh, onto like the bank versus insurance. I, I don't think it's like bank versus insurance. I, so I totally agree. Banks are very very important. But if you look at the ratio of like research that has been done on banks versus insurance companies, it's unmeasurable. Let me give you one example. On the AFA uh, conference, where there's like more than a thousand papers submitted, there were fewer than ten papers on insurance. And now we're jumping to sort of like 
um, uh, open end funds, which of course are also very important. And we tend to focus a lot on things that move very fast, like hedge funds, open end funds, things where, where we see spectacular failures. I think what is sort of like an important distinction with insurance companies is that they're constrained for like a long period of time. And if you really think about sort of what matters for the real economy is if the cost of capital gets sort of like, like affected for a long period of time, because these institutions are like constrained for like a long period, that's really where um, um, uh, there's a potential sort of like for, for um, spillover to the real economy. Um, and I, so, so I think a lot of it is like kind of unknown uh, in terms of like what the ultimate impact is. Um, in terms of like monetary policy, so I think there's a couple of like issues there. So one is that um, if, if like one feature that's important is that insurance companies hold securities typically until maturity. And so what that means is that suppose you have like a risk-free bond um, and you lower the long-term interest rate, uh, let's say in Germany, um, and you hold the bond until maturity, then sure, you, you, you realize the capital gain a little bit earlier, but over that, let's say, 10-year period, the insurance company is not helped at all by, by unconventional monetary policy. If it then buys a new bond, it's going to buy it at a higher price and the value of its liabilities are higher. And so if you think about sort of like, like from a risk-free rate perspective, long interest rates is really sort of like hurting insurance companies. I don't think there's another way to, to think about that. If it comes to credit risk, it's, it's, it's kind of a similar story because like you, you lower the credit premium, which otherwise they would have earned anyways over that long, long horizon. And so, so it's just sort of like front loading the capital gain component. Um, but if you hold it until maturity and you think about sort of the long-term risk to the insurance sector, uh, it really doesn't change all that, all that much. Um, so, so I think sort of like, like um, thinking about the implications for the insurance sector is, is important. Now, um, to the extent of like systemic risk, um, that's always kind of like a, a kind of a difficult question to like, what do we, what do we mean and, and how do we measure? Um, by measures that other people have proposed, let's put it like that, let's start there. Like if you think about S risk and so on, insurance companies always show up in the top 10 of most systemically risky sort of institutions in the US. Um, so at least by that metric, they, they are. Um, if you think about what happened during the 2008 financial crisis, um, um, it's not just AIG, it was also hard for uh, lots of like insurance companies in Europe as well that needed government support during that, during that period. Um, what the big advantages of insurance companies compared to banks is that you have time. So if an insurance company is underfunded, you're going to have like way more time to sort of like deal with the problem compared to banks where, of course, the payment system. So, so I think from like a high frequency perspective, you see large outflows out of bond funds, you need to act like right now. You see large sort of like run on banks, you need to act right now. Insurance companies will have time to, to think about what the best way is to deal with it, like transitional measures and things like that. Um, but I think what is important to realize is that in the meantime that you're dealing with the problem, sort of constrained insurance companies, they act in a very different way than unconstrained insurance companies. And so if you think about sort of like systemic risk as they act way more conservatively than unconstrained companies would do, um, then it would have an impact on, on, on funding costs of firms and, and the real economy. And so to what extent do you want to define it as like systemically risky or not? That's, that's I think it's a matter of definitions, but I think that's sort of the effect that's, that's going on. Um, so, um, in terms of like 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 in terms of policy, how would you regulate them? Um, I think sort of the, the key feature to recognize is that they have like very long dated liabilities that you cannot easily run on, uh, with the exception of some countries like France. Um, and so what you really want is if you take the logic from from banks and you sort of move it to insurance companies, is you want some notion of long term value at risk. And so if you start thinking like that, then also you can easily see that like unconventional monetary policy and things like that would like hurt insurance companies from that perspective, because the long run probability of them being able to deliver on their liabilities uh, does not improve if you lower sort of the, the, the interest rate, uh, the long-term interest rate. So let me let me stop stop there. So if there is uh, one moment, I wanted to, to elaborate sure. uh, briefly uh, on uh, what uh, Isabel was saying and uh, the fact that the bond markets are underdeveloped. In uh, some work I did with Manuel Adelino and Miguel Ferreira, we, so we, of course, these uh, bonds are uh, uh, issued by very few firms, but uh, we find that uh, the supply chains of these firms uh, are uh, actually uh, very international within the European Union. And uh, through the supply chain and pro through trade credit, uh, we find that these um, unconventional monetary policy trickle down so to small firms that uh, cannot issue bonds. 
or that are not uh, rated and uh, also trickle down uh, through to the periphery. So this is the good side. Of course, uh, everything comes at a cost because we also find that uh, these uh, companies that are eligible, uh, they have a lower cost of capital, uh, they expand their customer base. Uh, so in the long term, uh, we might observe that unconventional monetary policy leads uh, to more concentration in upstream market. But uh, I think that uh, considering the supply chain and uh, how these uh, uh, shocks uh, trickle down is uh, important for understanding the real effects. Thank you, Maria Sunta. So I see that it's 3.30 and Gemma uh, writes to me that we should wrap up because the invited session are about to start. I'm really sorry because I would have really liked to continue this discussion a bit longer, but I'm afraid that we will have to interrupt. So maybe we will have another occasion to continue, but thank you to all of you because it was very interesting and definitely a topic that in Europe should be discussed much, much more. So, and studied much more as Isabella said. So thank you very much and bye-bye to everybody. Thank you very much to everybody. Yeah, thank you everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.